In this video, uh, I'm going to explain one of the proofs uh, for the fact that we cannot write a general expression uh, for the solutions of a fifth degree polynomial equation using uh, elementary functions. Uh, the search for uh, expressions for solutions of uh, polynomial equations uh, was one of the most beautiful and important questions in mathematics which is now completely solved. Uh, two important developments in mathematics, uh, which are also important for physics and engineering, uh, largely came out from this uh, study. One is complex numbers, uh, and you need to know complex numbers to understand this proof. And the second is group theory, which you don't need to know to understand uh, this proof. The conclusion of this search is, is quite striking. Uh, uh, expressions for first, second, third, and fourth degree polynomial equations were found, and it was shown uh, that expressions for fifth or higher cannot be found. Uh, the idea of the proof that I'm going to show is to move the coefficients of the polynomial equation in a continuous way in a loop, in the sense that the coefficients will return to their original value at the end of the loop. When this happens, the equation will return to its original form. And this means that the set of solutions is going to return to the same set. However, as you can see in this example, and this is a real numerical example, the, if you follow one of the solutions, it doesn't necessarily return to itself. And in, at first sight, it looks like this is enough to prove the theorem because the solutions to the equation do not return to themselves at the end of the loop, while the coefficients do, and any expression of the coefficients will also return to itself. However, this is not the case, because uh, we are allowed to use roots uh, when we write our expressions, and roots have a few results. And these few results, as we will see, will not return to themselves. So this is going to be our main, main challenge, uh, addressing uh, expressions with roots. And the way we are going to do it is that we are going to show that for any expression, no matter how complicated it is, we have a systematic way to build sophisticated loops such that each of the results of the expression will return to itself at the end of the loop. This is on the one hand. Uh, on the other hand, we will manage to show that we can that for some of these loops, the solutions, the actual solutions to the equation, uh, do not return to themselves, and hence any such solution can be ruled out as a candidate expression, uh, general expression uh, for the uh, uh, solutions. Uh, the first step is to show uh, that we can build loops that do anything we want with the solutions. And the reason is very simple. For any trajectory we want the solutions to do, uh, if we look at some point along this trajectory, we can build the polynomial equation that will give uh, these roots uh, exactly in the way that is presented here. All you need to do is expand this expression, you will find the coefficients, and if we move the uh, solutions inside this expression continuously, the coefficients will move continuously, and if at the end of the trajectory uh, we will return to the same set of solutions, uh, the coefficients, when we expand this, will return to their original value. So we can build a loop that does whatever we want uh, with the solution. And now here we're going to start facing our main challenge, which is expressions that involve roots. So this is a particular, again, particular actual numerical example uh, of a fifth degree polynomial equation, uh, and this is a candidate expression uh, uh, for the solutions that has a third order root involving the coefficients, and since we have this root, there are, this expression in principle gives three different results. And when we, we follow a loop, uh, as you can see, the results don't necessarily uh, uh, return to themselves. And the way we are going to build loops for which each of these uh, result returns to itself is presented here. So first I will say just what we are going to do, and then in the next slide I will explain why it works. So what we are going to do is we are going to use 
uh, uh, two loops. So uh, uh, here in this example, uh, the first loop is exchanging this one, and the second loop exchanges these two uh, uh, solutions. And what we're going to do is follow a sequence of these two loops. First, the first loop, second loop, go back along the first loop, go back along the second loop. This is what we call commutator, this particular sequence of two loops. And for any such commutator, regardless of what these loops are, uh, as an expression that involves one root, as we will show, each of the results has to return to itself at the end of such a, uh, a sequence. And this is how we're going to attack first uh, such simple expression with one root. Later, we will show how to attack more general expressions. But why does this work for one root? So we need to just look what happens when, when we have an expression with one root. So first of all, uh, since there is one root, the, the argument inside the root does not involve any roots. So for each of the two loops, uh, uh, this complex number is just going to uh, return to itself at the end. It's going to do a loop of its own. Now, uh, what we want to ask is what happens to the results uh, of, of taking the root of, of this complex number. Uh, it's useful to write it in polar coordinates, and as we move along a loop, uh, r will change continuously and return to its original value. But theta will not necessarily return to its original value. This depends on whether or not we went around the complex uh, zero. Now, if we did go around the complex zero, uh, and in this, in the example presented in this slide, uh, this loop actually goes twice along uh, the complex zero, theta is going to change by 4 pi. And if we follow continuously one of the roots, which means one of these values of k in this expression, uh, at the end of this loop, it will return to, uh, in general, uh, a different uh, solution. So it will not return to itself. However, if we move, if we have two loops and we move along what we call the commutator, the sequence of first going along the first loop, going back, uh, going then going along the second loop, going back along the first loop, and then going back along the second loop, uh, in total we moved. Um, uh, back and forth around each of these loops and, and hence uh, the total change in theta is going to be zero. And this means that each of the results of this expression is going to return to itself. Now if we go back uh, uh, to the example that I showed, you can see that uh, this is true. So uh, each of the results at the end of the sequence returns to itself. On the other hand, if you look at the solution, for example, this one, you can see that it started here and ended here. So at the end of the sequence, it didn't return to itself. This, so this shows that we can rule out any simple expression with one root. Now we need to move on to more complicated expression, and the idea is going to be very similar. So here is an example of a more complicated expression that has a nested root, a root inside the root. Now, uh, again, the uh, expression inside the innermost root for any loop will return to itself. What we are going to do uh, uh, now is to uh, start with more loops. So we will start with four loops. It's okay if some of them are actually the same. Uh, it's go they're going to be denoted L1, L2, L3, and L4. And we're going to construct two commutators, first involving L1 and L2, so L1, two, go back along L1, go back along L2, and similarly uh, a, a second commutator involving L3 and L4. Now, each of, if we follow any of these two commutators, the inner, the inner uh, root uh, will return to itself, because uh, just for the reason that we explained uh, before. So now we have two loops for which the whole expression inside the outer loop, uh, loop returns to itself. This means that if we will take the commutator of these two loops, which is a long sequence of these L1s and uh, L2, L3, and L4s, at the end of the sequence, it's guaranteed that each of the results of the outer root will return to itself. And in the same way, regardless of how complicated the expression is, we will look for the uh, largest tower of nested roots, and then we will build a corresponding tower 
of commutators of commutators of commutators of commutators uh, of, of loops uh, and it's guaranteed that if we follow such uh, if the tower is long high enough if we follow such a sequence each of the results of the expression will return to itself now this is not enough to complete the proof because uh, there is no guarantee that the solutions to the actual, actual uh, polynomial equation will not also return to, to, the, to themselves. So the, the second part is to show that we can choose such long sequences for which the uh, solutions will actually not return to themselves. Now, in order to study what the solutions do, we do not really need to follow uh, continuously each of the loops. The only information we care about is what is the end result of each loop, if we want to know what the sequence does. For example, suppose uh, this is what the first loop and what the second uh, loop do. If we want to ask what happens to the commutator, and for example, let's ask what happens to x3, after the first loop, it will move to x4. After the second loop, x4 actually doesn't, doesn't change. We will go back along the first loop, so x4 will go back to x3, and then we will go back along the second loop, so x3 will go to x1. So as, we, as you can see there is in the result, x3 goes to x1. We can answer this question uh, just knowing the end results of L1 and L2. Now, uh, we are going to denote uh, such permutations uh, by a sequence of numbers uh, which just tells us each position tells us where did this uh, uh, element go. So in this example, uh, solution number three went to solution number four. And as you can see here in the final result, uh, uh, solution number three ended up after the commutator uh, as solution number one. Uh, and now uh, we can just play with different permutations and see if we can build commutators of commutators of commutators that gives us uh, a permutation which, for which uh, the, at the end the solutions did not return to themselves. And this we can actually do with a computer. Since this is a discrete question, uh, there is no error involved and we can trust the result that the computer will do and this is what you're going to see here. What the computer is doing now uh, is going over all combinations of all permutations of five objects. We have 120 different permutations and it's trying to calculate the commutator of any pair of such uh, permutations and there, is, there are 14,400 uh, permutations. However, since any such commutator, uh, commutator, any such commutator is a permutation by itself, uh, the total number of different results has to be smaller than 120 and what the computer tells us is that after he went over all of these possibilities, uh, he found actually only 60 different permutations. And now this means we have actually 60 different uh, permutations which can be written as commutators of two other permutations. Can we build commutators of commutators? Well, let's try. So what we are going to do now is go over these 60 and try all of their combination, commutators of commutators, and see what happens. And what we find is that when we do that, we get again 60 different uh, permutations that can be written as commutators of commutators. However, since in particular these are commutators of permutations, and we know there are only 60 such possibilities, it has to be the same 60 we found before. And this means that if we keep on doing that, we will always get 60. This means that we can build commutators of commutators of commutators uh, endlessly. And this ends our proof. For any expression, uh, we will see how many nested roots it, have, it has. Then we will build this 120 different loops that will give us all the permutations, and we can choose uh, uh, a level of commutators of commutators of commutators equal to the amount of nested roots in a way that, on the one hand, this it's guaranteed that any result of the expression will return to itself, and on the other hand, if we chose it correctly, uh, the solutions do not return to themselves, and hence we can rule out this expression. And to end this talk, I just want to uh, show why this proof cannot be applied to second, third, and uh, fourth degree polynomials. The point is that for these uh, polynomials there are less roots, and we cannot build endless towers of commutators. For example, if we look at the cubic equation, third degree equation, 
there are three roots, uh, there are six permutations of three roots, we can build commutators, we can build actually three non-trivial commutators, but if we try to build any commutator of commutator, we always return to something that actually the solutions to the equation actually return to themselves. So uh, uh, this means we can rule out expressions with one root, but we cannot rule out with this uh, logic expressions involving a nested root, and indeed the solution to the cubic equation has one nested root. The same thing goes for uh, uh, equations of degree 4, but for equations of degree 5, actually we can build endless towers of commutators ruling out any expression. Thank you very much uh, for listening.